Just how could a small-town farm girl from the Deep South become one of the most important female figures in mob history? This was the question Senator Charles W. Toby of New Hampshire posed to the beautiful but sassy Virginia Hill during the sensational Kefauver Senate Committee hearings on organized crime in 1951. Her response was classic Virginia Hill and left the committee reeling. Because I'm the best damn lay in the world. Dubbed by the press as the queen of the mob, perhaps a better designation would have been mistress of the mob. Virginia rarely met a mobster she wouldn't bed. Born on August 26, 1916 in Lipscomb, Alabama, Hill left the poverty of her small town and headed to the big city of Chicago in 1933, which was then host to the World's Fair. J. Robert Nash writes, She accepted a job as a waitress and might have otherwise been doomed to a life of obscurity if not for the intervention of Joseph Epstein, an ungainly little mobster who functioned as Jake Gusick's lieutenant in the racing wire racket. Epstein who was neither handsome or charming, made up for his lack of looks with a thick wad of cash. While perusing the fair's World of Progress midway, Epstein sauntered into a restaurant and met 17-year-old Virginia Hill and was immediately taken with her. Having enough foresight to see the opportunity in front of her, Hill flashed her dark sexy eyes and showed some leg, and soon became Epstein's lover. Years later, Epstein would tell the wily Meyer Lansky, once that girl is under your skin, it's like a cancer. It's incurable. It was through Epstein that Hill met many of the syndicate's top powerhouses. Men like Frank Nitti, Rocco Fischetti, Tony Accardo, Frank Costello, Charles Lucky Luciano, and Joe Adonis. And Hill? She would bed them all. Hill became so close and trusted by the mob that she was tapped to carry large amounts of money from one place to another. She always did what she was told, never spoke about it, and never shorted the bankroll. Though she would willingly spread her legs for many mobsters, her first real love interest may have been Joe Adonis. But it's possible that the affection only went in one direction, Adonis to Hill. Virginia was not looking to get tied down, at least not yet. But that would all change when she met the dashing and handsome Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. This time, the feeling was mutual. Hill fell, and fell hard for the tough, violent gangster. This began a rift between Adonis and Siegel, which many feared would boil over into a full-scale war. Carl Syphakis writes, When Lucky Luciano was released from prison and subject to deportation, the mobsters gave him a lavish send-off aboard ship. Both Siegel and Adonis were present, and the nervousness and hostility exhibited by Adonis toward Siegel was clearly attributed to jealousy over Virginia. Hill soon became Siegel's constant companion, both in and out of the bedroom. Siegel was constantly jealous and would challenge anyone who got too close to his girl. Numerous sources reported that the couple's relationship was volatile at times, but they always seemed to patch things up. When Siegel went west at the behest of the syndicate to oversee their interest, upon looking over the sands of the Nevada desert came up with the idea of a boom town where gambling would be legal. He pitched his idea to his partners for a casino, which would be a stopover for military men heading to the west coast. He would build the most luxurious hotel, naming it after his affectionate nickname for Hill, the Flamingo. The cost of building the Flamingo was way over budget and was showing very little return. His partners back east suspected Siegel was skimming the profits and using Virginia to convey the money to Swiss bank accounts. J. Robert Nash writes, Sensing that these were dangerous times for both of them, Hill advised Siegel to cut his losses and sell the flamingo. Here is part of her testimony before the Kefauver Committee. Siegel was uh, having trouble with any of his gangster I friends. never heard any time Eric, that he was having any trouble, and I never, all I know that he was worried about that hotel, and I, I hate the place, and I told him why didn't he leave it and get away from it because it was making him a nervous wreck. But Siegel wouldn't listen and refused to sell. As a result, Hill left Las Vegas going on an extended vacation in Europe.
On June 20, 1947, Siegel, who was staying at his lover's Beverly Hills mansion, was shot through the eye while reading a newspaper. It was reported that Meyer Lansky visited Hill in Europe and explained to her that the money had to be returned, which she promptly did. Many believed Hill had set Siegel up. Others won't believe it. She simply had no choice. Years later, she still professed her unwavering love for Ben, as she called him, and defended him before the Senate committee hearings. In one of the more sensational moments, a fit-for-TV drama, Hill, who grew increasingly agitated by reporters, connected with a right cross to the jaw of Marjorie Farnsworth, a reporter for the New York Journal American, knocking her to the ground. Unfortunately for Hill, the Kefauver Committee had already alerted the IRS, who determined she had spent $500,000 over the course of a few years, even though she didn't have any legally declared income. She tried to explain that the money was from gambling winnings, in which she always picked the winner, but they didn't buy it. As a way of escape, Hill married a Sun Valley ski instructor named Hans Hauser, and the two fled the U.S., landing in Austria. The IRS confiscated her property, including her house, and auctioned them off to help pay her back taxes. Aimlessly wandering around Europe, Hill could never find happiness. Within a few years, her marriage fell apart, and she ended up alone. Joe Epstein, the gangster from Chicago, who still felt responsible for Hill, would occasionally send her large amounts of cash when she found herself broke. But with age creeping up on her, and her youthful beauty fading, the once mistress to the mob fell into depression. Gone were the glory days of the past, the parties, the glitz and glimmer of the mob's number one mole. On March 24, 1966, at the age of 49, Virginia Hill ascended a mountaintop in Salzburg, Austria, took a bottle of sleeping pills, and never woke up.